Hello and welcome to a new edition of The Big Picture, the show where we try to take you beyond the news to understand the larger forces which are driving news events. Last week, the Supreme Court delivered a set of extraordinarily significant judgments on Ayodhya, on bringing the office of the Chief Justice under the Right to Information Act, on Sabri Mala. This was also a week which marked the end of Chief Justice Ranjan Gogoi's tenure. We will have a new Chief Justice from today, Monday. What are the implications of these significant judgments? What are the challenges behind that the judiciary faces? To discuss some of these issues, I have with me a special guest. Rishad Ahmed Chaudhary is an advocate on record at the Supreme Court, partner at the law firm Veris, and has done a PhD on the Supreme Court from the University of Chicago. Thank you so much, Rishad, for joining me. Thank you, Harry. Ayodhya was uh, a dispute that had been festering for a long time. Yes. Uh, the court took its time, but eventually delivered a judgment uh, on, 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 on the 10th. Uh, the judgment has provoked uh, various kinds of opinions. Many see it as the closure of this old dispute. Yes. Others have criticized the court for making, to taking logical leaps while delivering the judgment, which will now enable the construction of uh, Ram Temple at the disputed yes. site. What is your interpretation of the judgment? Well, it's, you know, to start with uh, Prashant, what I would say is, I think most of us would have to agree that the court had an unenviable task. It is something which perhaps ideally was not the province of a court at all. It is a dispute which involved the sentiments of a large number, bona fide sentiments of a large number of people on different sides of a religious divide and it is a sort of issue which ideally perhaps should never have uh, entered the sort of adversarial sort of forum that, that a court essentially is. Th that is one part of it. Having said that, attempts at mediation failed and ultimately th there was no alternative but to go the, the, the full route towards the judicial verdict. Uh, my sense is that some of the criticism is somewhat overblown or, or, or at least ignore some of the uh, limitations and uh, even the, the legal sort of norms that the court has tried to grapple with. We, we may not think perfectly, but it has. I think it's a, caref I think it's a careful judgment. It, it, it's, it's a more nuanced judgment than some people have given credit for. I think the, the, the judges have been very conscious of the next claim, perhaps from any religious community, of the, of the next uh, person who comes along and says, well, I want a particular civil dispute settled in a particular way because I think that concerns my faith. Uh, concerns my faith. I think so. So, you know, these are smart judges and they, 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 are, they are very conscious of the next such dispute a year, two years, ten years down the line. And in various ways, they have nuanced and um, uh, sort of uh, uh, reflected in their legal thinking the manner in which such claims can and should be dealt with. I mean, uh, to, to just take an example, the the, the places of uh, worship act, the, the manner in which they have dealt with it, the, the manner in which they have dealt with the the relevance or rather, rather the lack of relevance of real or perceived wrongs which have happened hundreds of years ago. So, you know, while some of that, a lot of that has been dealt with by the court for context, in the end, I think... All of us should take some comfort from the fact that the Supreme Court's final findings, right or wrong, rest on a view they have taken on the evidence with respect to possession of this particular tiny bit of land comprising an outer courtyard and inner courtyard. People have pointed to logical inconsistencies there about how when there was a mosque and, and a mosque which was demolished in the inner courtyard, how the, the entirety of the land is handed over and all. But the court, again, has given an answer there. And it's not necessarily an answer which satisfies everyone. But I think to say that it's just a mediation in the guise of a judicial order, perhaps, is somewhat uh, doing the court an injustice. In, in a very difficult situation, it has tried to come out with a pragmatic decision, uh, which, again, is based on the law as it is, as it perceived or viewed it, criticisms are inevitable in, 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 a, con in, in a case of this nature. It but is pragmatic, but is it just? I So, 
the debate will continue. I, I, I've not settled it even in my, my own mind for for that. I mean, it's 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 a long judgment. It's so so. Let's put it this way. I mean, what what the court the court said explicitly that a constitutional and re legal wrong has been committed, with the 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 Muslim community or the 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 by the, installing the, idols and the demolition both by installing idols as you correctly said and by the 1992 demolition. Now what uh, therefore critics of the judgment are saying is in a way that uh, that implies that possession was well with the the mosque or with the Muslim community and then how do you hand over the entire when the law of property is based well at least presumptively on possession how do you hand over the entire site the court has addressed that that's what i'm saying the court says that look uh, uh, that uh, the the outer courtyard was uh, visited by um, frequently by m members of the hindu community and uh, they prayed there and uh, that was generally that was not particularly disputed even by in court by the muslim community so there is this question of this outer courtyard and this inner courtyard in a way having different sort of uses and at some points the court has also said in arguments that this was this is the Indian reality of our composite culture. Unfortunately when it becomes adversarial in this sense there has to be one winner and a loser but I mean you look across towns and cities there are religious sites coexist like this. There are temples and mosques and gurdwaras all adjacent to each other. That's the reality. I mean that's why I said in a way the expectations from the court for us are unrealistic. You can give a ju judgment. Can you give justice? Would either party on any plausible verdict on any anywhere on the spectrum, someone would have perhaps gone away feeling that justice has been denied. Uh, uh, the, the, the court went, uh, another aspect is the grant of or, or the direction to grant five acres of land to the Muslim community. Now, we don't know what the litigants will decide. They have a right to refuse that land if they want, I assume. Some people have said it's patronizing. I think that's in the eye of the beholder, the litigants may view it as that. But I think it is fair to note that the court has said that it's restitution for a constitutional wrong. And so whether as a matter of principle that is a partial win for the Muslim litigants, it's for ultimately for them to decide. Let me uh, use that as a cue to move on to the other faith related judgment that came out last week, uh, which was Sabrimala. Yes. Uh, a five judge bench led by the Chief Justice has referred the case, the review petition, yes. uh, to a seven judge bench. Yes. And it has also enlarged the scope of the question yes. to include uh, the issue of whether Muslim women can enter mosques, yes. Parsi women can enter fire temples, yes. and uh, the practice of uh, female genital mutilation. Yes. Uh, again, there are two views on this. Uh, one is that the court was dealing with a specific review petition yes. should have delivered a judgment on that. Yes. The second is that the court has opened the door for gender justice uh, across faiths. Uh, which one would you tilt towards? So it's complicated, right? Uh, I think the Sabri Mala judgment, the original judgment, uh, where four is to one, uh, you know, arguably and inarguably actually, in a way... Which for the benefit of our viewers allowed women... Uh, allowed women to, to access, access this temple. particular temple. Uh, in a broad and general sense, of course, is a pro-gender equality judgment. I think uh, the, the point which, which the dissenting judge at that point of time, uh, Indu just Malhotra. Indu Malhotra, uh, said is that, look, are courts competent to interpret religion? Are courts competent to, in a way... Uh, enforce religious norms and diktats, in particular in secular country, and this is a powerful point. L look, it's a it's a point which, in a way, the 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 majority in today's decision, uh, when uh, in in the recent decision, when reopening the matter, is uh, uh, putting out there for broader examination. And I think there is also a sense there's a bit of a slippery slope because Sabri Mala is one. A particular temple with one set of religious practices. There's some historical controversy about how long back this particular prohibition on women entering the the, the temple went. Uh, but if you are to apply this touchstone of uh, equality in all senses and in the in the strictest sense to all religious practices in all spheres of life, you may come across a large number of arguable contradictions, imperfections, inconsistencies, injustices. And the question would be one, whether uh, 
you are required to as a constitutional court and two, whether it is you're perhaps competent to and you have the power to remedy these various injustices. So, I think uh, coming back to your question about the, 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 the narrow uh, um, sort of parameters of a review petition, you, you know, if you went strictly by the narrow parameters of a review petition, uh, uh, you would probably have maintained the, the, the original judgment. I think there was an acknowledgement by the majority uh, th that uh, there are certain questions which they think warrant broader examination and that I, I, I don't even think, I think in the opening lines of uh, the majority judgment, they even say explicitly that because certain new writ petitions have been filed, they are opening up the matter for broader examination. I, I think at some level, That's fair enough. The, the Supreme Court has that prerogative. Right. I mean, review guidelines are important for certainty in the law, for predictability, for, for an end to legal disputes. But we are dealing with at the end of the day, the Supreme Court and it can decide to take a second look at, at certain matters. I mean, yes. Let me move to the third significant judgment, yes. uh, which was the decision to uh, allow uh, the and bring the office of uh, the Chief Justice under the RTI. Uh, many have again hailed it as a landmark verdict. Yes. Uh, the judiciary has shown that it is willing to be transparent. Yes. Uh, it was an interesting case where one party was were officials of the of the Supreme yes. Court themselves. The court was a stakeholder. Yes. Uh, there has also been criticism that there are too many caveats. Yes. And uh, and uh, and that actually. Uh, restrict uh, the extent of transparency. Yes. What is your view? Uh, again, it could be a, a case of glass half full. I mean, that's that's one way of looking at it. Look, I think it's a significant judgment. I mean, you, you, you pointed to the slightly peculiar circumstances and where the Supreme Court is judging itself in a way. I mean, we call this uh, the doctrine of necessity or the court of necessity in, in where it's inevitable that you will be a judge in your own cause. There's no escape for it in legal doctrine. But there were, you know, the jokes and the Facebook memes. It is kind of funny that the Supreme Court appeals to the Supreme Court. That's true. But I, before I go into the merits even, you know, because we, we tend to be cynical about the institutions, person, I think it's worth mentioning much before the Supreme Court came into the picture, a single judge of the Delhi High Court and then a three-judge bench of the Delhi High Court both told the Supreme Court that your existing practices are inconsistent with the right to information. And that is a, an exhibition of judicial courage which I think needs to be needs to be acknowledged, sort of acknowledged much before uh, the, the final judgment of the Supreme Court. Having said that, it is significant because the Right to Information Act, look, in its on its face, could not be thought to really exclude the Supreme Court in all circumstances. That, that would be a very strange sort of uh, conclusion when you look at the broad sort of ambit of the Right to Information Act. Uh, having said that, uh, once you say that the Right to Information Act applies, uh, the exceptions in the Right to Information Act, uh, in a way, require a case-to-case uh, application on the statutory guidelines laid out there and in all cases, not just in the Supreme Court. Uh, but the Supreme Court has perhaps consciously uh, taken the opportunity of this judgment to put in place certain caveats where they have talked about, the, I think, the privacy of judges is one and the broader public interest. I think we'll have to see on a case-to-case -case basis how restrict this restrictively, how it's operationalized. Uh, but I think as a matter of uh, principle, it's... Um, it's a laudable judgment and as a matter of uh, principle, it's important for the court to say uh, that, I, yes, we, we fall, and that we, the, the law is ap applicable to the lawgiver as well as into the Supreme Court let, as well. Let, yes. me, let me then ask the last question, we are running out of time. All these judgments were delivered in the last week of yes. uh, Ranjan Gogoi's tenure. Yes. Uh, he's had a controversial 13-month yes. uh, run. Yes. Uh, looking back, how would you judge Ranjan Gogoi's legacy? Uh, one is it's been a consequential time. It's it's been a he's had a significant tenure. There are significant controversies that he has endured, and most of all, the sexual harassment charges which came up against him. The resolution of which left some people unsatisfied, and particularly Justice Gogoi sitting himself on a bench, which sort of commented on these charges and in a way condemned the accuser. I. I suspect he he would do it again differently if if he had the chance uh, today. I can't be sure, but that apart on the jurisprudence he left, I think Justice Gogoi has been a decisive ju judge. He has decided a lot of controversial cases, including Ayodhya, which perhaps it was more convenient perhaps for 
uh, or or uh, easier it might even have been easier to let slide and i think at least for deciding whether rightly or wrongly a certain measure of credit should be given to justice gogoi and yes. do you do you uh, I, i must ask a follow up there yes. uh, on certain key issues yes. kashmir for instance uh, the fact that he did not take up yes. the cases as urgently that he yes. should have uh, the fact that he has expanded the sealed cover juris Yes. Fiction, yes. Uh, or 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 his judgments on NRC, for yes. instance, that has also drawn criticism, right? Yes, absolutely. It has drawn criticism. Uh, for me, much of that is very troubling, I, and I don't. In my previous answer, I didn't intend to detract from any of that. So I'm glad you asked this specifically. Some a lot of that is very troubling indeed. I would say that some of that is a trend which has built up over decades in the Supreme Court, and therefore one judge with a one year tenure one chief justice with a one year tenure perhaps cannot uh, resolve everything some of it may even have expanded i think kashmir particularly is something which uh, is a serious serious uh, abdication i don't think any other word for it but i i would say the chief justice was preoccupied with the ayodhya case yes. which was heard for 40 days so he in fact delegated as he should because every judge of the supreme court as a judge is equally competent and experienced he assigned this particular cases to some other um, um, uh, senior ju- uh, judges heading benches and i think the way they handled these very very significant cases concerning the life and liberty of um, our uh, citizens. Uh, our citizens in in kashmir is open to very very serious criticism particularly when there there's a wide perception that it was done only perhaps so that in a way it's a faith a company and not not much can be done to reverse the situation later on i think that attracts significant criticism that's very useful and and a, a, a very useful discussion rishad and very insightful and original points thank you so much for joining us please join us for the next edition of the big picture okay.